or in the piano if you want to be in frame. Whoever. Okay, has it started? Are you? Yes. It's recording? Yeah, it says live. Okay. <laughs> So this is a work in progress. <laughs> Welcome to Newark First United Methodist Church uh, Blizzard Worship Service. And we are here in the home of Bob and Jean Bendix. My name is Lucina Halligan and I'm a certified lay servant in the Finger Lakes District of the Upper New York Conference of the United Methodist Church. I'm also your conference director of lay servant ministries. So we're going to have our shortened worship service here and I'm so glad you're with us. So to begin with, we're going to bring the light of Christ in among us. Thank you. <laughs> and now we're going to sing um, a doxology, come on in, that was written by Linda, Bonnie, Olin, and I think Linda might be with us. And so this is for you, Linda, and for everyone. <laughs> First United Methodist Church. Uh, Tuesday, uh, prayer for healing at 7 p.m. in the chapel, as usual. And then Wednesday, 8 a.m., Wednesday morning coffee club with uh, fellowship with the women at 8 a.m. at Wegmans. Bell Choir is practicing at 6.30 p.m. And Chancel Choir is practicing at 7.30 p.m. also on Wednesday. Thursday, caring and sharing, 10 a.m., uh, in the library, and council will be meeting at 7 p.m. in the lounge. I believe that's all I have for announcements at this time. Great. Thank you, Kyle. All right, so now we are going to start with our prelude. Whoops, sorry. Our introit, I guess. Hmm. Marching in the light of God, we are marching 
marching, we are marching, marching, we are marching in the light of God. We are marching, marching, we are marching, marching, we are marching in the light of God. We're upside down. All right, I think that we are having some technical difficulties. We are just going to um, No, you just, it's a stretch. All right, so excuse me one moment while I help our videographer. Do you need to do it that yep, way? that way. I believe so. Yes, all right. <laughs> so I guess you heard us all sing upside down. <laughs> Sorry about that. This is definitely Glitch Ministries. <laughs> Incorporated. It's the first time we've done this. Um, so thank you for... Um, you know, being tolerant <laughs> and joining us anyway. All right, we will open with a prayer led by Jean. Will you please pray with me? God of love, we rise from sleep to adore your holy name, presenting ourselves to you with thanksgiving for all your mercies. We glorify you, Father, for creating us and all that is. We glorify you, blessed Son, for being our savior, guardian, and friend. We glorify you, Holy Spirit, for indwelling us and guiding us in the ways of faith. Give us grace this day to walk in your ways, doing so in a way that sets us on your path for the rest of our lives. We know that you desire from us devotion and faithfulness, and so we offer our love to you now and always. Amen. Amen. The scripture today is from Psalm 36, 5 through 10, and I'll be reading from the voice. Your love, O eternal one, towers high into the heavens. Even the skies are lower than your, faith, than your faithfulness. Your justice is like the majestic mountains. Your ju judgments are as deep as the oceans, and yet... In your greatness, you, O Eternal, offer life for every person and animal. Your strong love, O true God, is precious. All people run for shelter under the shadow of your wings. In your house, they eat and are full at your table. They drink from the river of your overflowing kindness. You have the fountain of life that quenches our thirst. Your light has opened our eyes and awakened our souls. May your love continue to grow deeply in the lives of all who know you. May your salvation reach every heart committed to do right. Now we're going to have a um, prayer uh, meditation time. It, it's the time that we normally would be lifting the prayers of the people. And since we are such a large group, um, you know the things that are on your hearts <coughs> and in your hearts and the prayers that need to be lifted up. So we're going to start with a, a short um, centering song prayer, and then I will lead you in a, a short meditation, and then we will close with that same centering song. And it's, Lord, listen to your children praying if you know it. to at this point. Get yourself comfortable. <coughs> and Jean, if you could maybe just play some chords or something in the background, that would be nice. So we're going to 
going to be having a meditation. Um, this is from a book called Enter by the Gate by Flora Slauson Woolner. Send out your light and your truth and let them lead me. So find a comfortable, restful posture. Close your eyes. Take a deep breath. God's limitless love and strength undergird you and hold you. God already knows your questions, your problems, your prayer concerns, your longings. God longs to help you and to guide you. And the will of God, from both Greek and the Hebrew, means a deep desire of God. It's the longing of God. So take a few deep, slow, gentle breaths. Don't push and don't force. <coughs> Just follow your breath in and out. And then allow yourself to breathe naturally and peacefully. Let your hands rest comfortably. Relax your forehead. Think of each breath. As you breathe in, you're breathing in God's own life, his renewal flowing into you. Picture or just think of this breath of life flowing into all parts of your body, especially any bodily areas that feel stressed, tight, tense. Let these areas breathe the breath of life. And when you feel ready, ask yourself, how have you looked for God's guidance in the past? Do you turn to God through prayer? Through your worship service? through singing? Perhaps through your own conscious or intuition. Does God speak to you through scripture reading? through other books. Perhaps in your dreams. Or a walk in the woods or in nature. Or maybe an entirely different way. Now think of a time when you truly felt God's guidance, his hand upon your shoulder, and draw back those feelings. Did it bring you peace? Maybe it renewed you or strengthened you?
perhaps it surprised you. And it might have even caused some anxiety or fear. So ask yourself, your response to this guidance from God, how did it turn out? Were you able to follow God's guidance? Or perhaps the influence of others interfered? But rest assured that God is with you, surrounding you, filling you, encouraging you. And take a few deep, slow breaths. And let your body rest in God's presence. And if you have something you're facing, Perhaps you have a concern for others. When you're ready, bring them before God. And even if you have no words, rest assured that Holy Spirit knows your needs, your longings, your desires. You do not yet know what the answers will be, but God does. And you can trust that God will give you authentic signs in the right time. So just let whatever is on your heart to be enfolded in God's light or rest in God's heart. It may be helpful to think of Jesus holding everything that you need to bring to him, holding them in, your hand, in his hands. So rest quietly. It's very natural for your thoughts to stray. But bring them back to your breath. Breathing the spirit in. And allowing God to enfold and encompass you. God's light and hold everything that you have. And so when you're ready, breathe a few more deep, slow breaths. And gradually bring yourself back to your room, your chair, Wiggle your fingers, wiggle your toes, and open your eyes. And trust that the God of the universe has held you close and will continue to do so.
first I need to ask is the orientation right and everyone's okay? All right. <laughs> you are upright. Yeah, I'm upright. So again, I just need to remind you that this is a work in progress and a true adventure. <laughs> Um, at the very end, we are going to sing a chorus from the hymnal, the United Methodist hymnal, if you have one. It's called Fill My Cup, and what number is it? 641. 641. So at the very end, we're going to close with that, and you certainly are welcome to join us, and perhaps you even know it. So this morning's gospel reading from the lectionary is from the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. And it's a familiar story. It's the wedding of Cana, Jesus' first miracle, turning water into wine. Whenever I'm preparing for a message, um, and or just when I'm studying scripture, I like to take that scripture apart and look at it in the whole context of where it rests in that book of the Bible and in the story in general. See how it fits into the whole story. So the Gospel of John really stands apart from the other three Gospels or synoptic Gospels. It doesn't begin with the birth narrative or even the ministry of John the Baptist, which uh, the book of Mark does. Instead, it takes us all the way back to creation. You know the words at the beginning of John verses 1 through 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was with God in the beginning. Everything came into being through the Word. Without the Word, nothing came into being. And what came into being through the Word was life. And the life was light for all people. And the light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. We hear echoes of this description of Jesus as the word and the light um, also in our psalm reading that uh, Kyle read for us. You have the fountain of life that quenches our thirst. Your light has opened our eyes and awakened our souls. And may your love continue to grow deeply in the lives of all who know you. And may your salvation reach every heart committed to do right. So the Gospel of John continues to tell us then how John the Baptist will be the witness to the light and how the light will shower us with grace upon grace. How grace and truth come through Jesus Christ and how Jesus will make God known to us. So chapter 1 in John continues then with the story of Jesus' baptism and John the Baptist's testimony. It's interesting, last week Pastor Yang talked about Jesus' baptism and she read from the Gospel of Luke. And in Luke, it sounds like only Jesus hears uh, the testimony of the Holy Spirit. But in the book of John, we are told that it isn't Jesus, it's John the Baptist who receives that testimony. John tells of seeing the Spirit come down from heaven like a dove and resting on Jesus. And then he testifies that Jesus is the Son of God. The Gospel then tells us that Jesus begins calling his disciples. There's no mention of the wilderness experience or the temptations. We are told how he calls Simon Peter, Andrew, and another unnamed disciple. And these were all disciples of John the Baptist first. This is the day one narrative in the Gospel of John. And so then the next day, or day two, we are told of Jesus wanting to go to Galilee and calling Philip and Nathaniel. We aren't told about the remaining disciples. And so we really don't know exactly how many are with Jesus when we turn to our gospel reading for this morning. But there are at least five, perhaps more. 
The Gospel of John focuses on establishing Jesus as God, of convincing us that Jesus is the Son of God so that we might believe. And the word believe is used over 100 times in the Gospel of John. So with this image in mind, Jesus is the word of creation and everything comes into being through him. That word is life itself and that life is the light for all people always and forever. Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit at his baptism and began calling his disciples to teach them and show them the path so that they might teach others. So they need to believe and be filled with, to the brim with his love light so that we might believe. So day one, he's baptized and begins to call his disciples. And day two, he continues to call his disciples. And on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Jesus's mother was there and Jesus and his disciples were invited to the celebration also. When, they, when the wine ran out, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Jesus turned to her and said, Woman, what does that have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. But Jesus' mother said to the servants, Just do whatever he tells you to. Nearby, there were six stone water jars. They were used for Jewish ceremonial ritual cleansing, and each was able to hold 20 to 30 gallons. So Jesus says, said to the servants, fill those jars with water. And they filled them to the very brim. And then he said, now draw some from them and take it to the head waiter. And so they did. And when the head waiter tasted the water turn to wine, he had no idea where it had come from. Though the servants who had drawn the water knew, but the head waiter turned to the groom and said, everybody serves their best wine first. You bring out the second rate wine once the guests have begun drinking freely, but you, you've saved the best until now. This was the first of the miraculous signs that Jesus performed in Cana of Galilee. He revealed his glory and his disciples, they believed in him. These are the words of Holy Scripture given to the people of God. Thanks be to God. So I'm going to give you a little warning. Um, this message is really more of my musings about this scripture passage, so I hope you will bear with me. But when I begin to prepare a message like this, one of the first things I do is I read the scripture in several different translations, and then I begin asking questions. What are the questions that the given scripture uh, asks me, or I am asking of it? And so I'm, I'm going to just share with you some of my questions about this scripture. and You probably have others. But why does Jesus' mother Mary care if this wine runs out? We aren't told that it's any wedding that she is the official mother for. And why did she tell Jesus about the wine running out? I mean, what did she expect him to do? And how much wine are we talking about and why did the servants even listen to her and why did they do what jesus said and why didn't the servants tell everybody what had happened and why did jesus use stone water jars jars that were used for cleaning why didn't he use vessels that were used for drinking water or wine for that matter and why did they fill those jars to the very brim? Who does that? And why doesn't the head waiter ask the servant where the wine came from? And why didn't all eyes turn to Jesus 
I mean, wouldn't you think that Jesus would have been the must-have guest for any wedding from that point forward? So as I sat with these questions, I kept thinking about abundance and grace upon grace. Those were the thoughts that kept bubbling up to the surface. And in John 1.16, we are told, from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. And I also pondered the relationship that Jesus had with his mother. She is never called by name in the Gospel of John. And she only appears twice, once in this story, and then one at the very end, at the foot of the cross, at his crucifixion. But here she is, and she only needs to say a word to Jesus. Even what seems like a mild rebuke doesn't seem to daunt her at all. Like all good mothers, we know what's best, don't we? <laughs> we don't need to say explicitly things like when we walk into our children's room and this room is a mess. Or before they sit down for dinner, just look at your hands. What child doesn't know that means clean my room and go wash my hands before I eat dinner. Most children know what these comments mean. So that makes me wonder, what was life like with Jesus? What glimpses had she seen? What faith she had that somehow he would fix this thing? And for all we know, she may have expected him to run down to the corner market and buy more wine for the wedding. I don't know. But perhaps she was also one whose eyes were opened that day. We're told in the birth story that when the shepherds came, she pondered all these things in her heart. And perhaps she's been pondering for all these 30 years. And this brings the story full circle. To witness the abundant, extravagant grace that Jesus bestows. And why did he do it? Because his mother desired it and the amount of grace that he gave that day it was over the top six stone jars holding 20 to 30 gallons each I did the math and if I was in worship at our church there's a gentleman named Chad Sheckler if you're watching Chad who would have already figured this math out I know <laughs> but I had to use a calculator Chad but this is the equivalent of over 700 bottles of wine. And not just any wine, this is the very best wine, the most expensive and exquisite wine imaginable. This was enough wine to continue this wedding party for a long time. Jewish wedding celebrations in those days lasted for several days. So this was grace upon grace abundance to celebrate life it was more than they needed more than they could imagine so what does this story mean for me what is jesus the giver of life and light and grace upon grace whispering to me or to you through these words but my thoughts turn to the empty stone jars jars that were very utilitarian Nothing special or ornate, just jars that were used to hold water to make things clean. But they were empty. Have you ever felt like an empty jar? I know I have. Like there's no hope or goodness in this world, no kindness or goodwill. Sometimes I feel useless. Sometimes I just feel plain and ordinary. Sometimes life feels a little bit like drudgery. Sometimes joy and celebration are far, hard to find. And usually it's when I've said yes to too many things or my to-do list is so long I can't even find the end of it. And I feel a little lost and everything is a struggle. And this is the place where this story breaks into my everyday living. It reminds me 
that if I only look to Jesus for the answer, just like his mother did, just like the servants did, if I look to Jesus and dare to fill myself to the brim with his promises, to remember that life at its heart is a celebration, abundant grace upon grace, and Jesus is there, waiting to be invited in, waiting to turn the ordinary water into the choicest wine, to be living water. He revealed his glory and his disciples believed. And by filling ourselves to the brim, we will become the light and life so that others may believe as well. May we not just be people who tell about Jesus but be people who help them experience Jesus so that they will know his love is real. Mother Teresa had a poem on her wall that I feel really speaks to this miracle of filling our jars to the brim and how we can do it. It goes like this. People are often unreasonable, irrational, and self-centered. Empty jars. Forgive them anyways. Fill them to the brim. If you are kind, people may accuse you of selfish, ulterior motives. Empty jars. Be kind anyway. Fill them to the brim. If you are honest and sincere, people may deceive you. Empty jars. But be honest and sincere anyway. Fill them to the brim. What you spend years creating, others could destroy overnight. Empty jars. Create anyway. Fill them to the brim. And if you find serenity and happiness, some will be jealous. Empty jars. Be happy anyway. Fill them to the brim. And the good you do today will often be forgotten. Empty jars. Do good anyway. Fill them to the brim. Give the best you have and it will never be enough. Empty jars. Give your best anyway. Fill it to the brim. In the final analysis, it is between you and God. It was never between you and them anyway. So in these days, may we be willing to be filled to the brim, to be part of the miracle yet to come, and to encounter unexpected delights along the way. This was the first of the miraculous signs that Jesus did in Cana of Galilee. He revealed his glory. And we? We believe. Be filled to the brim and let his light and love shine through you. Amen. 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 So we will close with Fill My Cup, Lord. What was that number again? 641. So come on over. <laughs> Thank you for joining us and have a blessed day. Be safe.